All the links for this video will be found in the description box below. Hi, I'm Courtney, and welcome. We are continuing our study on the book of Revelation. Today we are going to be in Revelation chapter 2, and we are going to look at chapter 2 and chapter 3 as the seven churches of Revelation. So today in chapter 2, we are going to look at the first four of the seven churches. And so we'll be reading in Revelation chapter 2. I'm in the New King James Version, and I'm going to go ahead and read. You can follow along in your Bible and pull that out, or you can pull up your Bible app in the New King James, and you can follow along with me. Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and you have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Verse 8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer, Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, I, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds." I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. 
And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 2. Let's begin in prayer. And gracious Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. We thank you so much for the teaching of the seven churches. And today, as we focus on the first four churches, please help us to understand your Word and to have it speak personally to us. And we thank you so much, Lord, that your Word goes out and does not return void, but accomplishes the purpose for which you send it and prospers in what you send it to do. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So now we are looking at these seven letters to seven churches that Jesus asked John to write. Each of these seven churches uh, represents an actual church that existed during the Apostle John's time on the island of Patmos in 95 AD. But the seven churches are very interesting because not only do they represent actual churches during that time, there seems to be some sort of uh, prophetic uh, revelation of the, in the churches themselves as they go through each, as we go through each of the ones throughout church history. There seems to be a progression of that is that has been shown in church history where each of these church represents a time in church history, even though all of them can speak to us today um, in the things that Jesus is showing us as he writes to each of the churches. So as we look at each one, we're going to uh, look at first the characteristic of Jesus that he wants to highlight in that church and oftentimes the characteristic that he highlights in that church is reflective upon the message that he is speaking to them. Remember in our last video we looked at the seven attributes attributes of Jesus Christ and we remember that the number seven represents completion. So when we looked at the seven attributes of Jesus Christ we, we were given a complete picture of who he is in his glorified body. So as we go through each of the seven churches we're going to look at the attribute, sometimes he gives one or two, um, sometimes he gives a few more, that he focuses on about himself as he delivers the message to the church. So let's look at the church in Ephesus first. So he says, and I'm in verse one, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So he starts with the church in Ephesus and he begins with the very place that John first saw him in Revelation chapter one. Remember back in Revelation chapter one, um, and I'm looking at Revelation chapter one, verse 12. And it's in Paul and um, excuse me, John writes, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. So he saw him in the seven, walking amongst the seven golden lampstands. But the other interesting one um, is he's holding the seven stars in his right hand. And if we remember in Revelation chapter one, Jesus himself told us in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So these are the attributes of Jesus he wants to highlight for this church. And what he's saying to this church, beginning in verse two, is a commendation. Usually in each of the churches, Jesus gives some sort of commendation. Not every church, but most of the churches receive a commendation to begin with. And for Ephesus, it says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and, not, and are not, and have found them liars. 
and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So these are all the good things that the church in Ephesus was doing during this time. And it's interesting because the church in Ephesus uh, tradition says that the apostle John himself may have been one of the elders of the church in Ephesus. So he is writing this letter back to a church that he himself may have pastored. And, um, and they, were, they were an important church because during the first century, we had the true apostles, the 12 apostles of the Lord, and we had all these false apostles or false teachers that were infilt infiltrating the churches with all sorts of false teaching. And, um, and so this church was really focused on making sure they were testing those who were the true apostles and the ones that were the false apostles or the fake apostles, they were seeing that they were liars. And oftentimes the false teaching had to do with something that made the gospel impure and brought in works to somehow complete your salvation. Well, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again on the third day and he ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father and he's coming again. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we put our faith and trust in Jesus' work on the cross for our sins. And we do not believe that any of our works save us because we cannot be saved by our works. Only Jesus' perfect work can save us because he's the only one that perfectly lived a sinless life and he obeyed the Father and he was the only one that was worthy and counted worthy to go to the cross and die for our sins. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so these false apostles would come in and teach that you had to do something more to be saved. Okay, and this church in Ephesus tested them and found them to be false. So Jesus had quite a commendation for them. Okay, so let's pick up in verse four. Now he has a commendation, but now he has something that he is pointing out to them that they need to be corrected on. So he has a commendation and he has a correction. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So they did all of the right things in being obedient to Jesus, but they left their first love. Now, what does that mean to leave your first love? Let's take a look at love as the Bible defines it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So we can turn to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and Paul gives, gives a definition, the Apostle Paul in this letter to the Corinthians gives definition for what love is. And he says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. Love is not something that we can muster up in our own strength. God is love, and it's Jesus Christ dwelling in us that loves the way that we can love others. He is the one that does it. So if Jesus is saying to them, you have left your first love, is it perhaps that they were, they were trying to do all the right things and follow him, but they were doing it without love being the primary reason for them doing it? Sometimes we can start walking in our, we can follow Jesus in our Christian walk and it can just be, and we can be believers, we can be born again believers, but we can get to that point where we are just going about the things that we need to do and we are not focusing on the relationship with Jesus that we need to do it in. We can be doing the right things, we can be following him in obedience, but we are not doing it in relationship, in love. And so perhaps that's what he's saying to them here. You have left your first love. I think about uh, when a teenager 
I might have a crush on a on a boy or a girl may have a crush on a boy or a boy may have a crush on a girl and it's interesting to think about those first loves that what are some of the characteristics of it you can't stop thinking about that person you can't stop talking about that person you can't stop uh, looking for opportunities to spend time with them you can't wait to see them again uh, Jesus talks about the faith of a child when we are in the kingdom of God and so therefore we want to be in a relationship with Jesus where we cannot stop thinking about him. We can't wait to meet with him and be in his word. We can't wait to see him when he comes. That is about being in relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we want to remember our first love. We want to remember that this Christian life is about a relationship with Jesus Christ and that we walk in obedience to him and we do the things that please him because of love because of relationship with him that's what makes it exciting that's what makes it fun to follow him when we make it about relationship and that's what he is asking of this church to remember so then he says in verse 5 remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This church was in peril and a possible opportunity to lose the light of Jesus Christ in their church if they did not repent and start doing the things they did at first based on love. And, and then he goes on to say in verse 6, but you have this I hate. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, the Nicolaitans, quite simply, in Greek, there's two Greek words there that you might sound that might sound familiar to you. Nike or Nike, uh, like the brand Nike, it means victory. And uh, Laetans, the laity, the people. So it looks like in this case, that the laity somehow in the church was trying to have the victory, but really they were bringing destruction to the church because they weren't the appointed members. Uh, they weren't the appointed by God to be able to run the church. Uh, so that was something that Jesus hated because he himself has authority over his church to give to each church member the place in the church which they are supposed to have so he he puts up he puts apostles which he did in the first century then he puts the elders and he appoints the deacons and he appoints the teachers that is his responsibility to do and it's not up to the laity to, to decide that is something that we seek Jesus Christ for for the roles and the place that we have in the church so moving on, he says um, in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now he will say this seven times throughout chapter 2 and 3. Seven times. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That means anybody who is listening, anybody who can hear, needs to hear the message of Jesus Christ to his churches to his churches to him who overcomes i will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god so at the end he gives a he gives a promise to the overcomers in this case they who overcome will have the right to eat from the tree of life which in the, is in the midst of the paradise of god now it's so interesting to see how revelation ties into genesis when is the last time we saw the tree of life well we saw it back in genesis chapter 1 chapter 2 in the garden with adam and eve before the fall we saw the tree of life, which was part of God's original creation. So the first time we see it is um, Genesis chapter 2. And Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is, pleasing, that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when Jesus is saying, promising the overcomers that they get to eat from the tree of life, he is pointing back to the original creation of God in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, which was 
was God's intention for humanity. Then in Genesis chapter 3, of course, we have Adam and Eve disobeying God by listening to the serpent who is the devil and Satan uh, tempt Eve to take a bite of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that she was not supposed to do and she disobeyed and she gave some to her husband. And then that is what caused the world to go into the sin that it is now and the fallen nature that it is now. But in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, uh, Jesus is reminding them that overcomers are going to have something like what was experienced in Genesis chapter one and chapter two when man and woman walked with God in the garden. So that is a promise and that is pointing to what we are gonna see at the end of Revelation in chapter 21 and chapter 22. So you definitely wanna continue through this series to see all the way through what God has in store for us in Genesis 21 and 22 because it's really exciting. So let's keep moving. Let's go on to the next church, Smyrna. All right, so Smyrna, uh, he says, this is the, the descriptors or the attributes of Jesus, he points out. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. So he's reminding that he is the one that died and came to life. He is the first one to be resurrected from the dead. All right, and Smyrna actually means myrrh. And if you remember that myrrh was one of the spices that was used to wrap Jesus in his burial cloth when he was put into the tomb. It was a burial spice. So that is very interesting to link the name Smyrna myrrh with this situation because this was a persecuted church. So he says to their, them, their commendation was, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So they suffered greatly at this church and they were persecuted. And he's telling them, do not fear any of the things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. This church had martyrs that died for the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why he wanted to emphasize his attribute that he was the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. He is the resurrection and the, of, and the life. So those who died in Christ Jesus and were martyred would be a part of the resurrection of life. They would have eternal life. Even if they died, they would live forever with Jesus. I love the fact that this church receives no correction whatsoever. They only receive commendation from the Lord. And then it says in verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. He promises them eternal life in his kingdom forever. Those who have died for his name, who have not renounced their faith in Jesus Christ will have eternal life with him forever. Amen. All right, let's go on to the next church, Pergamos. Okay, and let's see what is attribute he points out. So I'm in verse 12. It says, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. So what did we say was the sharp two-edged sword that came from his mouth? We talked about this in Revelation chapter 1. Well, the sharp two-edged sword that comes from his mouth is the word of God. He speaks the word of God and the word of God is powerful. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, and we'll look more detail at what the Word of God is described there. So I'm going to turn to Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to look at, um, starting in verse 12, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, and it says, uh, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and, of, and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So he's pointing out once again, the power of the word of God to discern the hearts 
and the minds of everyone. So in this church in Pergamos, it says, verse 13, he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So again, we have a church that dealt with martyrdom he, and they didn't deny his name. They didn't deny the faith in him. And this was really important. And they had a martyr. They had um, a martyr named Antipas. He was faithful and he was killed. And Jesus also points out that this church was where Satan's, uh, Satan dwelt. He dwelt in this part of Asia Minor and Pergamos. Uh, which is in, is in modern day Turkey, in that area of the world right now. And then he says in verse 14, But I have a few things against you, because you have those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So now he is referring back to the book of Numbers in chapter 24, where there was a prophet named Balaam. And Balak, the king, wanted Balaam and wanted to pay him to curse the Israelites. And this was during the time of Moses and the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness with Moses and all the Israelites. And so this prophet Balaam, was going to be paid money by King Balak so that he would curse the Israelites. And he, he tried to, but he couldn't. He couldn't do anything but bless them. So when I look at this, uh, I think that they were possibly dealing with some anti-Semitism in their church. They were dealing with people that were trying to curse the curse modern day Israel cursed the Jews and that was not something that was pleasing to Jesus because Israel and the Jews are very very important to him he has a covenant that he made with them through Abraham through Isaac through Jacob that he intends to keep with Israel when he returns to this earth so it's important that the church does not uh, curse in any way the Jews because the Jews are still God's chosen people let's look at Genesis chapter 12 uh, and take a look at the blessings that are promised to those who support Israel so Genesis chapter 12 I'm gonna turn there and we're gonna look at starting um, in verse 3 he says and this is God speaking to Abram when he's calling Abram out to leave his country and to start this nation that's going to be called Israel. He says to him in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this church was uh, possibly not being faithful to the Jews and uh, this was not something that Jesus wanted or tolerated and then he also said thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which I which thing I hate so we had seen this already in the church in Ephesus as well and we had talked about that repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth so again he is going to use the word of God as the judge to be able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the hearts in this church and then he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone and on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So he talks about the hidden manna, which I think is very interesting since we just referred to the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. What were they fed during that time? They were fed manna from God, manna from heaven, heaven, these sweet flakes of bread that appeared on the ground. And that's how God supernaturally fed the Israelites. So Jesus is pointing to that and saying, I will give to you the hidden manna to eat. Now, who is the hidden manna? Is it the 
flakes, the wonderful flakes that came from God, or is it Jesus himself? Remember, Jesus said that I am the bread of life. So he is the reward that we have here. And it also says, I will give, I, excuse me, and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. That is very exciting. That tells me that we are going to receive new names when we go to heaven, that Jesus himself is going to give us. And oftentimes names in the Bible uh, reflect an attribute of that person. So for instance, Jesus's name in Hebrew is Yeshua and Yeshua means salvation which is exactly what Jesus is he is the salvation of the world so it's interesting to think what names we will be given that reflect an attribute that God has given to us as a gift or called us to do in his kingdom so that's something to look forward to all right let's go on to the last of these first four churches this is the church in Thyatira so I'm in verse 18 now uh, these things says the son of God whose eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So he's pointing out the fact that with his eyes, he can see perfectly into the hearts of people. He can understand and he has a fiery, passionate love for his people and a jealousy for those who try to harm his people. He has a jealousy in the sense that he wants to protect his people. He wants to keep them as his own and he doesn't want to have anybody harm the relationship that Jesus has with his people. That's the jealousy. He does not want any other person to come between him and his beloved. And his feet like fine brass. That's showing that he is a perfect righteous judge. And he says, and here's his commendation, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. These are quite commendations for these churches. Um, they, had, they did the right thing in being obedient to what God was calling them to do. They had love, they had service, they had faith, and they had patience. And as for their works, the last were more than the first, which means that they were growing in their relationship with God. They were growing in obedience to him. And therefore, as they're growing in obedience, they can hear more clearly what he is calling them to do, and they are walking in it. Uh, so he has wonderful things to say about them, but then he goes on in verse 20 to say, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So this church had a false prophetess that Jesus referred to as Jezebel. And what he was doing in that is having them recall the Jezebel of the Old Testament found uh, in during Elijah and the prophet Elijah's time and the prophet Elisha's time in 1 Kings. And I'm going to turn specifically to 1 Kings chapter 21. And I just want to read a few verses that help us get a picture of what Jezebel was like. So I'm turning to 1 Kings chapter 21. And we can turn there together. And in this passage, in 1 Kings chapter 21, her... Uh, Jezebel had married King Ahab and King Ahab was upset because he wanted this vineyard uh, from one of uh, from Naboth that was there. He asked him he wanted to purchase this vineyard from him in the land and Naboth refused. And so it says starting in verse four. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed, and he turned away his face, and would eat no food. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. 
Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels before him, to bear witness against him, saying they have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So this was what Jezebel did and in uh, the Old Testament. So Jesus is pointing out the evil of this woman in the church of Thyatira. And when I read that story, I look at a woman who had usurped her husband's authority to go over him, to take his seal, to write a letter, and to have this man killed who righteously did not want to sell his vineyard because it was his father's vineyard. And so, um, he is very unhappy that this church puts up with her false teaching. And he get, and it says here, 21, and I, he, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she does not repent. So Jesus in his mercy gives time for this church, uh, for this person to repent. She refused to. And so he says, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And then he says in verse 23, And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. He clearly wants to make an example out of this church because of their tolerance for this woman who is teaching uh, sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And he's saying he is going to judge. He's going to kill their children with death that all the churches would know that he is the one who examines the minds and hearts and gives to each one according to your works. And so we see here a righteous judge, a righteous God of love and justice, because we are going to have to give an account of our Christian life, whether we were obedient to him, whether we did the things that we were called to do using the gifts that we were given. And we are also called to not compromise the word of God. If someone is not teaching the word of God, the message of God, we are to have sound doctrine. We are to rightly divide the word of truth. If someone is not teaching this or trying to add to this in some way or try to take away from this in some way that is something that we ourselves need to understand and hold that person into uh, account for that because this is the only word of truth and I personally as someone who has been called to be a Bible teacher for women and for teens that I take it very seriously that I am only teaching what, with what the Bible says and I'm only teaching things that I have understood and I have studied and I feel confident enough to share in teachings. If there is something I don't yet understand about this book, and there are many things I don't understand completely about this book, I'll make sure that I either just let the scripture speak for itself or I will um, continue to research it before I say anything about it. That is really important to do. And that's something I wanna hold myself accountable to, to make sure that I am accurately dividing the word of God when I bring these teachings. Okay, number 20, uh, verse 24, now he says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put no other burden, I will, I will put on you no other burden. I think this is wonderful, because he's showing that he understands that there are people in this church that are not giving in to Jezebel's false teachings in this church. They are ones that do not know this, that are continue to follow Jesus, rightly and he's saying to them I will put on you no other burden because like he already said he is the one that searches minds and hearts and he will give to each one according to your works so I think that is very comforting to know that he knows uh, we are not called to be uh, obedient perfectly we can't do that we are still uh, sinners saved by the grace of God we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to lead us into righteousness uh, but we're still going to make mistakes here 
And Jesus knows this. Uh, so therefore, we were called to walk by faith and not by sight and be obedient as best we can. But I think the point is, if the, he is he is convicting us of something, that we need to be we need to make sure that we hear that and we repent. And that was the problem here. She refused to repent. So therefore, him being the righteous judge, the one who had eyes like flames of fi a flame of fire and feet like fine brass, he had to render justice. He has to. Okay. And then he goes on to say in verse 25, but hold fast what you have till I come. He is promised to return. He will return to take his church to himself and gather us to him when he appears. And we are going to talk about that in great detail when we get to Revelation chapter 4. We're going to talk about what's called the rapture of the church or the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Okay, verse, 20, uh, verse 26, it says, And he who overcomes, and here is the promise for those who overcome, and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. And I, as I have also received this from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So to those who overcome, we are promised to rule and reign with Jesus in his millennial kingdom, in his thousand year reign. We are going to talk about that in more detail when we get to Revelation chapter 19. But how awesome is it that if we continue to be faithful and obedient to him moment by moment, abiding in him, that we will rule and reign with him when he returns to this earth. That is something to look forward to. I'm excited about that. Jesus is coming and we are going to be with him in rule and reign. So I hope the first four churches gave you some encouragement. It gave you more insight into Jesus himself because remember this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, our, our objective here, our goal is we want to get to know him more intimately, more deeper, understand who he is so that when we know him in this personal relationship and we understand who he is, we are in a, a position to walk more closely with him. So I hope that brought you some encouragement. If you were f corrected in this, these teachings, that's the point. He corrects because he loves us. If you found yourself uh, feeling a correction here, know that he loves you. He wants you to repent. He wants you to follow him more closely. There might be something wrong with the way that you are thinking about something. And he says, no, don't go that direction. Come back to me. Repent and come back to me. This is what the truth is. And let me show you the way to go. And you're going to be at peace following him more closely in that. So, so heed that correction. And then for the uh, for the overcomers, we have so much promised to us in Jesus. And so it's exciting to know all the promises of following him. I know that walking with him can be difficult. This world is challenging. This world is getting darker by the day. But know that you have the victory in Jesus Christ as you continue to follow him. Don't give up keep going forward and as he says hold in verse 25 hold fast what you have till i come let me pray for you and we will uh, close out this teaching father i thank you so much for the first four churches of revelation i thank you for how jesus has been so faithful to show the attribute of himself that he wants to focus on, to give a commendation, to give a correction because he loves us and the promise for the overcomers. Lord, we have so much to look forward to in you. Help us to continue learning and growing in you and following you wherever we go. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Here's a summary chart that shows what we just discussed in the first four churches. We'll discuss the rest in our next video.